Hey guys and gals, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. So you may on Twitter the Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming back at you in another Let's Play episode of Temptations Ballad. So y'all, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right back into it, shall we? Please sit back and enjoy by entertaining you. Let's jump right in. Alarm Chan, you are up, and let's go. Alright. Uh, remember which one we did. Voxor or the Great Axe? Okay. <clears throat> The signature weapon of Marrow Bonebreaker, this great axe sports a massive blade that shimmers as dark as midnight. Crafted by the disgraced blacksmith Clyde Bessemer, this axe features the finest and sharpest Damascus steel in the land and possesses the ability to neutralize magic at the slightest touch. Quite fitting for a barbarian who holds magic in great contempt. Marrow named his masterwork axe Voxor, or roughly translated, Sister's Voice. It helps, it helps cut through all the bullshit in my life, Marrow Bonebreaker asserts with a grin. Interviewer notes that there was well, there was a bittersweet edge to the warrior's voice as he spoke. Glass eye. Fans and admirers across the city have frequently offered to craft stylish eye patches for Marrow, all of whom he had declined. His missing eye was a product of his mistakes and misplaced loyalty, and he chooses to wear his glass eye proudly as a reminder of what truly matters. Upon close examination, the scar tissue around his eye indicates that the injury was caused by a magical source. Huh. Interesting. All right. Chapter two. Let's go to Hamish. All right. Spotted Haina. For wow, Hamish is forty-four. Damn. No longer allowed access to the files. Bro, uh, a beast in the bed, a big meanie, professional cutie, husband. Aww. Nineteen dexterity is really high. Charisma? Huh. Charisma is kind of low. Interesting. Become irreplaceable. Never give them a reason to leave. Hamish began life as the humble son of a hunter and a scullery maid. From a young age, he was trained in the art of hunting and tracking by his father, and brought home quality meats and pelts to support his family. His home life was a modest but happy one. When tragedy struck and Hamish found himself alone in the world, he was taken in by Marrow Bonebreaker and served as his right-hand man. Soon after, a romance blossomed between them, and these two hyenas have since become inseparable. Despite the man's stern exterior, Hamish is rather sensitive and prone to crying. It is a habit that he had learned to curtail over the years, especially in the presence of their son, but it occasionally resurfaces behind closed doors. Marrow thinks it's adorably sweet, like while Hamish threatens to make Marrow sleep on the couch the next time he calls his crying spouts cute. Items. Cape of Holding. Huh. A cape whose fibers are woven from several disassembled bags of holding. Though he would never admit, though he would never admit it, Cole got the idea for his own loincloth of holding from Hamish. Unlike his son's sloppy job, Hamish's cape was skillfully woven over the course of several months and is incredibly durable. The thick cloth, the thick cloth is capable of softening blows from arrows and daggers alike. The various pockets lining the interior can hold up to 500 pounds of goods, which Hamish uses to store weaponry, medical supplies, and tools for his wire traps and hunting efforts. During a certain incident, Marrow jumped inside the cape as a joke and disappeared for about six minutes before the Bonebreaker mercenaries managed to drag his unconscious body back out. It turned out it was very hard to breathe inside a cape of holding. Hamish refused to sleep with Marrow for about a week after this incident as punishment. Many members of the Bonebreaker Guild recall witnessing their leader reduced to tears during this period of punishment. Nightcrest Longbow. Ooh. Hamish's preferred weapon is a sleek and unassuming bow. The high draw weight allows him to fire multiple arrows with great force over a massive distance. One of the Bonebreaker's preferred strategies is for Marrow to lead the charge against a group of enemies, drawing their, drawing their attention while Hamish picks them off from a distance. Instead of wearing a quiver, Hamish keeps a variety of specialty arrows within his cape of holding. Wire thread. Oh, damn, that looks painful as fuck! Hamish keeps several types of trap wire within his cape of holding. Thin wires for subtle traps, and thicker barbed wires for ensnaring larger prey, and tiny threads for flossing teeth. Curiously, he also owns several rolls of wire made of pure etherite, a metal that conducts magical energy and functions as a great supplement to spellcasting. Oh, uh, wait, no, 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 I'm dumb. I already did that. Turn to me, menu. Okay. One second, y'all. Drink my coffee. Ah, delicious. Delicious brew. Alright. Alright, skip and proceed to chapter three. Proceeding. <laughs> chapter three. The person my choice is made. Firefly Festival. Oh god, I just I just watched the uh, the internet historians uh, was the the fall of Fire Festival or whatever it was called. My god, what a great video. 
The Firefly Festival was one of the biggest festivals within the city of Axia. Taking place over the course of three days, and sometimes longer depending on how many drunkards linger, the city is al alight with celebration, competition, and partying. Each day the festival honors a different aspect of life. The first Firefly Dance celebrates the present in the form of a sporting competition. The famed Axia Jousting Tournament and Grand Brawl is held to commemorate our rivalry and camaraderie with our common man. All warriors from across the land are welcome to test their mettle in the brawling tournament. Fight amongst yourselves to see who is most fitting for the title of champion. The City Watch would like to remind all fighters to cover the blades of their weapons with protective wax that festival organizers are providing in order to prevent the great toe-chopping incident from ever reoccurring. The City Clerics were exhausted after spending hours magically reattaching lost digits and firmly request brawlers avoid any under-the-belt tactics. The winner of the Grand Brawl will receive a handsome cash prize provided by this year's sponsors, House Osmia, who have generously taken up organizing duties after the recent passing of our beloved King and Queen. More refined and noble individuals may prefer the grace of the jousting tournament. Participants are required to bring their own steed in order to, in order to qualify. The winner of this tournament will be gifted a boon from the Honorable House Osmia. Many thanks for their incredible generosity this year. The second day, the Firefly Festival is a, mem is a memorial to the past. It's been honoring our loved ones who have passed on. <sighs> oh, sorry, y'all. Something's got me all stopped up. Probably the coffee or something. I don't know. The lantern lighting event will be held at midnight in Central Town Square. This year, a great mural of our late king and queen shall be erected upon the town square gates in their memory. All are encouraged to attend. Finally, the last day of the festival is in celebration of our future to come. Parties and alcohol will fill the streets with jovial cheer. Remember to have fun and enjoy yourselves. Festival organizers would like to remind all attendees to remain clothed while in public areas. <laughs> Naughty people. Artemy flipped through the festival pamphlet with a giddy grin. Her tail wagging impatiently, she sat in the Bonebreaker Guild lobby. I've never attended such a crowded event before. Of course, I will focus on our goal of investigating the nobility, but I hope we still have time to partake in the festiv festivities while we're there. Do you think we can spare some time for recreations today, Cole? Hmm? Cole? Where did you... Artemy glanced about in confusion. There was a low yawn as Cole, Cole sleepishly staggered into the lobby and squinted at her with the half-lidded eyes. The three of them had agreed to meet here at the Bonebreaker Guild early this morning to prepare for the festival, but Cole was never one to stick to a schedule. It appears he wasn't the only one. Sid was also nowhere in sight. Cole stifled another yawn before stumbling his way towards Artemy's table and stealing a gulp of her tea. Hey! Are you still reading that damn pamphlet? Daytime events are kinda okay, but the real fun comes at night in Rotten Red's Alley, if you know what I mean. Heh, <laughs> the gay bar is always fully packed during the festival. Artemy blinked. Hmm, what makes these specific bars more happy than the average? Cole sighed and stole another swig of Artemy's tea. Don't worry about it. Anyway, there's something else I gotta ask you about. He, sca he spared a quick glance around the Bonebreaker lobby. At this hour, nobody else was around, and it looked like Papa hadn't gotten up yet. Good. Cole discreetly dug into his pockets and tossed a handful of arcane crystals onto the table. Can I ask you for a favor? Can you charge up a few of these crystals with some combat spells? Alright, sit right there. Let me drink the rest of my coffee. Oh, one moment. Mmm. Delicious. Now that we're diving into this investigation, we might run into that cloaked mage again. Especially me, since I've got the, uh, <clears throat> uh, never mind. As a guy with no fighting ability or offensive spells, I want something up my sleeve in case shit hits the fan again. Artemy frowned, confused. Why would feces ever collide with a... It's a figure of speech. Listen, can you just hurry up and charge these babies up before my papa comes down here? Artemy pouted. I'd appreciate it if you explained these confusing idioms once in a while. She reluctantly held up one of the arcane crystals and closed her eyes. Sharp streaks of lightning suddenly erupted from her hand and darted from one crystal to another, igniting them with a painfully bright glow. Here you go. I've charged these crystals with several casts of Thunder Wave. They should serve to incapacitate any foes you come across. She handed Cole another crystal with a much softer glow. And this one is charged with a cure wounds for when you face any, any light entries. I pray that you won't have to use it. Cole grinned and held one of the crystals in his hand like a child with a new toy. It buzzed with a warm, tingling sensation against his fingers. Magic would never cease to fascinate him. Artemy cleared her throat politely. Speaking of being prepared, is there anything I should know before beginning our mission today? I understand that I am rather inexperienced with social gatherings. I wish to make a good impression if our goal is to earn the trust of these nobles. Cole snorted. 
Experienced? That's putting it lightly. Rude. Cole reached for the last of Artemis' tea, but held, but yelped as his hand was swatted aside. Quit stealing my drinks! Is this how the Creator's Chosen treats those seeking help from? Those she's seeking help from? Scandalous! This has nothing to do with being chosen, all to do with you being a brat, Cole. On the contrary, your actions hold more weight than you think. You ask for advice on dealing with nobles? There are two things you have to keep in mind. One, they treat their blood as though it runs with gold. Are you part of a noble family or bloodline? No? Then they want nothing to do with you. Someone like me or Sid would be looked at like gunk, like the, like the gunk they're scraping off the bottom of their boots. <sighs> you, on the other hand, are a different case. Not exactly a noble, but as the daughter of the Grand Bishop, you're bound to get a little more respect from these folks. Not to mention the whole chosen one thing and whatnot. Artemy fidgeted uncomfortably. Ah, uh, yes, I, I quite understand. Your Excellency had forced me to memorize all the major family trees of nobility during my training. The charts were very large, and I never finished studying them. The Knight Commander accidentally mistook the charts for scrap and used them in his paper mache project. Are you sure that was an accident? Of course! The Knight Commander would never make a mockery of such an important subject! Anyway, what does this have to do with anything? Hey! Cole grabbed the last of Artemis' tea and drank it down in one gulp. Ah, sweet caffeine. And here's point number two. Noble's treasure status. You're a bit of an idiot, but you're still the creator's chosen. That gives your presence and words a lot of social weight when it comes to dealing with nobles. It wants to be so it wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if a few tried to butter you up to get on your good side. You can use that to your advantage when you're talking to these people. Try and fish out some gossip and news about powerful folks who have grown interested in rubies or power recently. Artemy frowned as she struggled to wrap her mind around the idea. But surely I do not hold such importance. Hmm. This is much more complicated than simply participating in today's festivals. I hope we still have some time to enjoy the Firefly Festival between all this. Cole suddenly felt his pocket shift as Malice crawled out onto the dining table. I concur with your smelly celestial friend. I think of all the food that we can sample at this festival. Puny mortal, I command you to visit every food stall we come across. I must savor the many tastes of the material plane. Hey, what are you doing? Malice screamed as Cole grabbed a large bowl and tossed it over the tiny python, firmly trapping him against the table. Tiny thumps reverberated through the wood as the snake struggled to escape. You should really treat your pets with more kindness, Cole. Ha! <laughs> no. The two of them suddenly perked up at the thundering sound of footsteps. Marrow Bonebreaker poked his head into the tavern lobby, his ears perking curiously at the sound of Malice's muffled screams. Well, well. <clears throat> Y'all sound pretty chipper this morning. Good morning, Sir, Mo Sir Bonebreaker. Cole flashed Marrow a panicked smile before hastily shoving all the arcane crystals into his pockets. Yeah, hey, Papa. And we're just prepping for our, uh, our plan for the Firefly Festival and whatnot. Will you be participating in the brawling tournament, Sir Bonebreaker? It sounds right up your alley. Marrow, bon Marrow barked a hearty laugh and shook his head. Never. I usually don't do the Firefly Festival. Why ever not? Marrow gave a nonchalant shrug. Sorry, lass. I gave. I have this medical condition where I developed this uncontrollable urge to clobber nobles on sight. My, that sounds serious. You should see a healer about this immediately. Cole sighed and rubbed his temples. Dude. Ha! There's no cure for this affliction, I'm afraid. Anyway, what are you kids waiting for around waiting here around here for? Don't pay any mind to an old yeen like me. It's a festival. Go out there and enjoy yourselves. Artemy yelped as Marrow delivered a backslap so hard she felt her bones rattle. She scrambled to reassemble her loosened armor as Cole received a much gentler, friendly slap of his own. <laughs> Will do, Papa. We're just waiting for another for my other lackey to show up before we head out. Ah, you mean Sir Sid? He arrived and left a long time ago. Cole blinked in surprise. He, he did? When did this happen? You were very asleep. Long after our appointed meeting time. In contrast, Sir Sid set a diligent example by arriving and leaving early to attend a training session with Sir Clyde. He said he will meet us at the town square later. Oh, right, the whole weapons training thing. Cole snorted. Knowing Clyde, I'm sure those two are being very productive right now. Oh my. Now, make sure to grip the pole firmly and squeeze. Sid's mind was utterly blank, save for the fact that Clyde's face was dangerously close to his own. His cheeks felt hot as the sensation of the tiger's low breath tickled his ears. 
Dude, are you even paying attention? Oh, of course I am! Everything's great! I just gotta grip the pole firmly and, and, uh, and... Sid jumped as he felt Clyde's warm hands caress up the length of his muscular arms as he adjusted his posture. You're getting the hang of it. Focus on your stance when you swing, or the sheer weight of the lanius will knock you off balance. When you're thrusting your thick spear, make sure to adjust your hips like so. Clyde's hips were suddenly flush against his backside as a large tiger squeezed his biceps teasingly. You're doing this on purpose, aren't you? I have no idea what you're talking about. I am sure they are being they're being hardworking and disciplined warriors. You could learn from their example, Cole. Doubtful. Cole took a sip of tea and frowned at his empty cup. I'm glad Sid's hanging out with Clyde, though. He could use some friends who aren't the two of us. Clyde's a clever and caring guy, too. He'll catch on to what Sid needs. Artemy blinked. What do you mean? You mean you haven't noticed? Sid's been all mopey and twitchy since yesterday's training exercises. He's not very good at hiding it. I did notice that he had been rather uncomfortable in my presence earlier this morning. He was very hasty to leave. Artemy bit her Artemy bit her thumb with a worried frown. Have I done something wrong? I don't mean to upset him. Cole sighed. No, you haven't done anything wrong. Just keep in mind who you are. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to go ahead and pause it right there. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell. Leave a super thanks or tip if you can. It always helps. Until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.